This is a Brain Ponderings podcast. I'm your host, Mark Matson. Sit back and enjoy as my guests and I take a deep dive into the brain and health and disease. In this episode of Brain Ponderings, it's my pleasure to talk with Guo Li Ming who is uh, currently the Perlman Professor of Neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine up in Philadelphia. I've known Guo Li for quite a while because before she got recruited to Penn, she was on the faculty at Johns Hopkins University where I have an adjunct appointment. Uh, also, I've known of Guo Li's work for a long time because it some of it was actually very asking some of the same questions I asked in my postdoc work. Her early work, she was studying um, the mechanisms that control the growth of axons and dendrites as they seek out their targets. And I'll let her talk about that. And then she uh, wanted to move on from cell culture work to things that are more directly relevant to in vivo. And so she's developed some very interesting three-dimensional, what are called organoid systems for studying this. In addition to trying to understand what normally goes on uh, in the development of the brain and the formation of neural networks, Guo Li has made major contributions to understanding what goes wrong in developmental brain disorders, such as um, schizophrenia and um, autism. And then finally, uh, another thing I'm gonna to talk to her about is her work on infectious agents and how they may affect brain cells. So Guo Li, I'll start with my first question, which is you, you grew up in China, and you initially uh, went to medical school there and got an MD degree. And then at some point you became interested in basic research. Can you kind of tell me a little bit about your experience in China and what led you to a career in neuroscience research? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the introduction. So initially uh, in China, I uh, went to medical school really because of my, both of my parents think that they need a doctor at home. So <laughs> that's the reason I went to medical school. And right after I finished, actually, I let me uh, give a little bit more introduction for the medical school. I actually uh, went to a very special program in general, uh, in China, you go to medical school right after finishing the high school. And in China, most, most of the uh, universities, the length of the medical school is five years. And I went to this actually special program that, which, which is six years. And the, the way is that the first year, actually they uh, focus on a, a foreign language actually, which is German. So actually I learned German in, in medical school. So I went, when I finished this six year program and I got married uh, to another scientist as well. And at, of course at that time he, uh, he was not. Uh, I got married and I came to the United States. As you can imagine, no, basically knowing nothing yeah. for English, I have to start over from the very beginning. So I try to, so I kind of go to, my husband was a graduate school uh, with a moving pool at that time at Columbia. So basically I just tagged along and uh, went to the lab with him every day with the hope that I could learn some English. Of course, I tried to take some courses as well. So my main goal at that time was to learn, um, make, try to improve my English uh, at that time. So I went to the lab every day and I was, actually there was a, a student in Mumin's lab actually doing work with 
Axon guidance at that time. So that was 1994. And that was the first time I actually watching a live cell moving around under the microscope. I was so amazed. I thought this is so amazing. I mean, of course, in the medical school, I did look at the microscope, but that, that's all fixed tissues and fixed cells. And the ability to looking at a live cell doing moving around, that was really, really amazing experience. I, and I was really thrilled. The well, initial goal for me actually is to uh, take the board exam in the States and see if I can actually uh, go to uh, do the medical uh, things and be a clinician. And after the experience in the lab, I was really attracted to the idea, maybe I, I should do something like this. And that was the decision, maybe eventually I should go to the graduate school. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's kind of similar to me with regards to being uh, fascinated by being able to look at individual nerve cells, uh, under the microscope and watch them grow. And, you know, you working initially with uh, frog spinal neurons, right? That's and, right, yeah. And, and me looking at hippocampal neurons. Uh, yeah, so can you tell me in, in, in your PhD work, what your main findings were, what you observed, what manipulations you did to the neurons and, and what you discovered? Yeah, so actually my research happens before the graduate school. As I uh, told you earlier, uh, uh, I, I was still trying to really improve my English. Okay. So, um, and I told Mu Ming um, that I was so fascinated by this moving growth cones and the neurons. So he was kind of enough to say, since you are in the lab every day, he uh, offered me a clinician job. Um, so you're for, you had a first author nature paper. That's that's during that period. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, as a technician, that's... and I yeah I really would like to thank Mu Ming again. He actually treated me as more as a graduate student uh, uh, than as a technician at that at that time. So he allowed me to work on individual projects in the, quite independently at that time. So then, I actually got quite a few publications during my uh, time uh, for two years as a technician. Uh, Mu Ming's and uh, he's in China now, or is he splitting time? Or he's full time in China right yeah. now. Yeah. So for for listeners who aren't aware of this, well, I think most are. China has made a major investment in, in basic research over the last, say, 20 years. And my experience was, for example, I mentored many postdocs that came from China. And until about, say, I'd say 10 years ago, none of those postdocs would even consider going back to China. But now many are considering it. And some, for example, have a recent postdoc now who's got a really nice position in China uh, with a lot of support for their work. So I think the United States, we're still, we have still good university system, but we need to invest more. Uh, China is gonna surpass us in basic research. Okay, so let, let's move on. Um, well, you didn't describe what your finding was in the nature paper. <laughs> well, yeah, so um, that was actually really a surprise finding. As I, as I mentioned, I was really fascinated about this, how growth cones move around and how do they tell which direction to go? So uh, there was a very simple assay developed in Mumin's lab is that they can create a gradient of a factor um, that uh, was thought to play a role to guide the axons or the growth cones, the tip of the axon to grow to towards specific directions. 
And we have this simple in vitro assay to actually, by creating this gradient, the growth cone can sense this gradient and tell which direction and make a decision which direction they want to go. And at that time, I was trying to, uh, still during my technician time, I was trying to do some manipulations to see how the environment might influence the growth cone response to the different factors. And the factor I was working uh, at that time was called BDNF or brain derived uh, nerve factors. And uh, under normal conditions, this growth cone are usually attracted to the gradient of BDNF. So they would turn and move toward the higher grade concentration gradients. And I was at that time trying to say, if I manipulate the environment, say, change the calcium concentration or change uh, to very common cyclic nucleotide concentration uh, in the bath, what does that would in influence the decision of the growth cone uh, make? And there was a very, very surprising finding is that uh, when I lower the cyclic, uh, cyclic AMP uh, concentrations, this growth cones that, uh, that they are usually attracted, instead they try to actually turn away from this BDNF gradient. Uh, so I told Muming about this. At the very beginning, he actually doesn't believe. He said, that just, just cannot be true. Um, they follow where they are guided. Uh, they follow the guidance cues and go where they are supposed to be. And now you are saying the same guidance cues. And when you change the second MP levels within the cell, they decide to go a different way. So he said that cannot be true. So, um, but then he actually, I think he went to um, give a talk somewhere and talk to Mark Tassel Levine who is the, actually the, uh, uh, the first one to identify the natron uh, 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 guidance cue, uh, another uh, guidance cue. And he's, he said, this is, a, this is amazing. So Muming came back, we did a lot more experiments and um, proved that's true. It's actually, there's a both factor and the environment decide how the growth cone actually, uh, uh, where to go basically. Yep. This often happens in science. It happened with people working in my lab where you make a hypothesis and the initial the result you get is like the opposite result of what you predicted. And then it, it turns out those kinds of results are more often right than results where you predict something and it turns out as predicted because people have some there's this like unconscious bias sometimes, depending on what the experiment, we have ways to try to eliminate it. But, in, you know, so yeah, um, yeah, we had some discoveries with, for example, tumor necrosis factor, where we were finding good effects when everybody else was saying, no, this inflammatory molecule is, you know, always bad. Uh, Okay, so then you, let's move forward in time and let's get to some of the other systems you subsequently started using. And you can tell us by systems, I mean, other than dissociated neurons and culture and, and why you started using those systems. Yeah, so, um... Since I've been uh, for the duration as a technician and as a graduate student uh, in Moomin's lab, um, I've always been using this in vitro growth cone turning assays that, uh, that I just described to look at the growth cone uh, behavior. And when I established my own lab, I thought I would love to see this uh, in vivo. So initially we try to see whether we can um, and I think you mentioned that I've been using the Xenopus spinal neurons uh, dissociated in culture. So we are trying to see then in my own lab, whether in vivo in this developing Xenopus embryos, whether we can look at a growth cone behavior 
and whether we can when we be, uh, manipulate either the signaling or the gradients, whether we can see different uh, growth cone uh, responses. So we actually was able to do that. Uh, we uh, 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 finally uh, discovered a way allowing us to look at the uh, axons uh, where they go uh, in the developing spinal, uh, spinal cord of the Xenopus. And then um, I did actually a very brief postdoc with uh, Rusty Gage before I uh, started my own lab, this, the, which is pretty short. Uh, this less than a year. But that, those are the time that I was uh, exposed to a new system. Uh, uh, at that time, that's actually quite new as well, called adult neurogenesis. And this is another amazing finding is that uh, most people think the neurodevelopment only happens in early in life, uh, most, and mostly is a prenatal embryonic. And what the finding for adult neurogenesis is that this neuro, uh, neurogenesis process, the whole process actually is also occurring in adults, uh, and uh, especially in rodents. The, the adult neurogenesis in the hippocampus area is quite robust. And I thought maybe I can also take advantage of this adult uh, neurogenesis or neurodevelopment process to also ask the questions about axonal development, dendritic development, and axon guidance. So I started also use adult neurogenesis as a model system in the rodent system, um, uh, so not in the Xenopus, uh, to try to study what's happening uh, during this development, but in a unique time uh, in the adult brain. And I, the, the advantage, of course, in the hippocampus, as you know, the neurogenesis actually is pretty unique in that they only generate one specific type, uh, type of neurons called the granular neurons. Yeah. So that's only a single type of neurons so that allow you to be uh, 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 less worry of variability. And the comparing to the embryonic development, adult neurogenesis, the whole, uh, whole process is uh, much longer than the early development. So we have the time window actually to study in details what's happened at each individual steps. So, um, so using that system, we also studied how uh, the dendritic growth, the axonal growth, uh, in in the in the adult uh, uh, rodent brain. Yeah, it it is amazing how, how quickly the the brain develops. Uh, from so in in mice and rats, typically it's um, approximately three weeks, and the whole brain from an initial stem cell, actually from fertilized egg to whole brain, occurs in three weeks. So hundred several hundred thousand neurons. Uh, all connected. Uh, yeah, that yeah. which is amazing, yeah. right? And okay, so you moved to hippocampus, and hippocampus has a lot of relevance to, and we'll talk about this, to many different, uh, it's critical for learning and memory, and it's, it's vulnerable to dysfunction and death of neurons and a number of disorders. Also, it's involved in some of the developmental disorders we'll talk about. Now, one thing is that, that's important to mention for the listeners is that those neurons that come from the stem cells that Guo Li was talking about, they deploy glutamate as their neurotransmitter. And it's the major excitatory neurotransmitter. Uh, and and he, in mammals, about 90% of all the neurons in the brain are glutamatergic. Most of the other neurons use the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. And um, I guess since this is on my mind not right now, Goli, I saw you did some work. Uh, during development, there's this interesting thing that happens with GABA. Can you explain that? In the adult brain, it's inhibitory. Uh, but during early development, it seems not to be. Yeah, so this is actually uh, has something to do with a special property. Uh, like during the development, 
uh, they express different genes, which uh, actually there's a, a pair of uh, transporters. So this, uh, this transporter is called NKCC1 or KCC2. These are chloride transporters. And the intracellular concentration of chloride basically determines how the neurons respond to GABA. Uh, if it, they express NKCC1, uh, when GABA comes in, it's a depolarizing signal. And when they, it, it, during the maturation process of these neurons, they started to, to switch from the expression of NKCC1 to KCC2. So this time, the neurons actually maintain a very low chloride levels. And when kaba comes in at this time, they become hypopolarizing or inhibitory to the neurons. And what we found is that, yeah, so in the adult hippocampal neurodevelopment, this switch also occurs. And that, and that the, this is one thing that perplexed me in my postdoc work, I, I showed that glutamate inhibits dendrite outgrowth and, and that promotes synaptogenesis and that involves calcium movement uh, uh, into the cell and that affects the, the cytoskeleton of the cell, the polymers and proteins. And, and I, I was always perplexed, well, we, there's all this evidence calcium is so important, but GABA should decrease calcium. So how do, does GABA then, see, I didn't know back then that there was this switch where early on GABA is actually excitatory and cause calcium influx. So that, that can explain uh, explain all of this, that when the connection is initially formed, GABA is excitatory and that kind of, the changes occur stabilize and promote the formation of the synapses. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So in the developmental phase, the neurons actually, they have to actively moving around to sense the gradient. So we actually did a quite a bit of study uh, with the, uh, the or in of the calcium signaling in gross cone guidance as well, uh, but you can imagine when the axons are actually moving around and trying to identify their synaptic partners, it's active moving phase. However, when they found their partners to form the synapses, that's the phase they actually have to signal a stop signal where they have to stabilize rather than uh, further moving uh, uh, around. So you can imagine the switch of this, their, their behavior, or as well as their internal signaling is actually very important for the functional establishment. So from then from moving from studying stem cells and, and how they form connection, new neurons and connections in the dentate gyrus or the hippocampus, you uh, develop what, are what you call organoid systems, where essentially, or another term people use is mini brains, where you can essentially in, in this interesting, uh, use this interesting technology to essentially cause different brain regions to form in ways that look like they do in vivo. Can you just Describe what organoids are and how you go about establishing them. Yeah, so as as trained, I guess as trained as a in the medical uh, school, I always fascinated what's happening in humans, right? So um, although I've been using this animal model systems, I always would like to uh, think about whether this is a also the same process in the developing human brain. And in the early times, basically there's no way uh, or no system allowing us to address those questions. It's very difficult to culture human neurons, of course. And uh, um, it's also very difficult to get any human tissues. Um, when the um, human induced uh, pluripotent stem cells come along. This is actually a great work uh, developed by Yamanaka's group with 
uh, simple reprogram strategy, you can turn uh, any cell type basically into a pluripotent stem cells. So that was termed iPSCs because they are induced or reprogrammed. Um, the property of this iPSCs is pretty much like uh, embryonic stem cells. So they can in principle give rise to all cell types in, uh, in, in a body. And um, of course that give us the opportunity that you can also reprogram the human cells. Uh, and then and this is the way to bypass the difficulty of getting human nerve cells and allow you to differentiate this human iPSCs into different, different type of cells. Again, you can get basically in principle all cell types in the human body, but of course what we are most interested in are neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, all the cell types in the nervous system. So initially uh, we are doing this uh, by differentiating iPSCs into uh, as I mentioned, different cell types in uh, kind, they call this monolayer cultures or 2D cultures, basically very much like what we grow uh, rodent cells in the dish. And later it was identified by a phenomenal work by Jorgen Noblik's work it, uh, lab to show that you can actually, if you grow them, the iPSCs in suspension cultures, they can spontaneously generate 3D structures that much like what's happening in the developing brain. And they initially, they call this cerebral brain organoids. And we are kind of very excited, as I, as I mentioned, I'm actually very, very excited to, to know that we can use this iPSCs to generate 3D structures, allowing us to address questions of neurodevelopment. Uh, so we quick try to uh, we adapt the technology in the lab, and uh, quickly we found uh, there are quite a bit limitations. Um, the initial protocol is that they completely just use uh, intrinsic intrinsic signals. So if you don't uh, maintain this human iPS cells uh, for at the stem cell state, they will just spontaneously differentiate, give rise to nervous tissues. Uh, this is because the nervous system actually is the um, earliest uh, in development, earliest uh, tissue being generated. So they just spontaneously actually generated the nervous tissue the first. However, we found that indeed you can get this uh, uh, um, brain-like tissues. However, they're very, very heterogeneous because you never know how the intrinsic signal is re regulated you get different brain parts, uh, some more like forebrain, some more like midbrain, and some more like hindbrain, but they're just randomly distributed. And you don't know uh, which part is actually dominant because you get all different types in culture. And that gives us difficulties in terms how we can do quantification and determine uh, function, fun functional importance in this system. So we thought maybe we can try to uh, direct this iPSCs to a more specific fate because we already been working, we've been already working on uh, specific differentiation from iPSCs to different type of neurons. So we know we can pattern this iPSCs, for example, to full brain uh, progenitors. And then later we also identify to uh, pattern them, for example, to uh, midbrain progenitors or hypothalamus progenitors. So by first patterning this iPSCs toward a specific brain region fate, they, which allow us to generate a more homogeneous type of brain organoids. So we developed the protocols to generate four brain organoids. So which is uh, mimicking mostly the cortical uh, development. And we also uh, subsequently, we developed quite a few protocols for generating midbrain organoids, uh, hippocampal organoids, as well as um, other uh, uh, hypothalamus organoids. And 
what kinds of experiments are you using these organoids for with regards to normal brain development? Um, back in the, this is a long time ago, back, well, not that long, back in the 1990s, I did a few studies of embryonic human primary neurons in culture. And one thing that I observed that was seemed striking to me is they seem to grow much more slowly that, than the rodent ones, which was kind of interesting because the, the time course, obviously, of human brain development is over nine months, whereas, as I mentioned, three weeks for the rodent. Have you noticed this with the organoids? Do the neurons tend to grow more slowly? Of course. Yeah. So I think this uh, there, there is a, an intrinsic clock. Um, we, I don't think we have figured out a way how to manipulate those clock yet. Yeah. So uh, con in contrast to traditional 2D cultures, um, and usually we have difficulties maintain them uh, for a long time, right? Yeah. Uh, so usually the culture can be maintained for a few weeks. Yeah. But yeah. for this 3D brain organoid structures, because they maintain uh, the cell-cell interactions and some structural fe features. So you can actually maintain these organoids for a long period of time. Uh, for example, uh, we have, can maintain them to over 200 days. And there's also a report uh, uh, suggesting they can be even maintained up to two years. Wow. So yeah, so you can maintain it for, for long term. And this gives us the opportunity actually to look at the developmental trajectory. And indeed, as, as you suggested, the developmental phase, the neural stem cell proliferation, uh, they are, uh, uh, they are uh, gave rise to uh, different type of neurons and the neuronal maturation all takes a much longer time than a rodent brain, but we know that in rodent and neuro, neurogenesis and neurodevelopment phase is like very quick. So there is this intrinsic uh, clock regulation. It does mimicking the developmental time required uh, yeah. in vivo, uh, even you try to replicate them in vitro. And I, I assume then, so these neuro, neural networks are forming, you have essentially cerebral cortex, human cerebral cortex developing with the six layers and so on. And there's, is there spontaneous activity then, I assume, in these neural networks? Has that been looked at? Yes, actually, uh, we and several other labs did look at that. Uh, so uh, it does follow and maintain the structural uh, features of the developing uh, cortex, meaning that you have different uh, stem cell zones and during development, they generate sequentially different type of neurons populating different cortical layers. And uh, eventually they do form synapses. We can show morphologically, they uh, have this very nice synapses by uh, imaging. Uh, if you fill the cells with a dye or with a with a green, green fluorescent protein, you can see the spines, and you can by uh, uh, immunostaining you can actually mark both the presynaptic and the postsynaptic side. You can see the nice synapses, and more importantly, if you want to look at the functionality of these neurons, the most common way, of course, is to either calcium imaging or electrophysiology and you can record from these neurons and to show uh, that they are electrically active as well. So we show that, that they actually receive both excitatory synaptic inputs and the inhibitory GABAergic synaptic inputs as well. Okay, so this leads me to the, the next area that you've been doing a lot of work on over the last decade or so. And so with these, iPSC cells, one can just take, for example, skin cells from any human, and you turn them into these pluripotent stem cells, and then you can form different brain regions that are organized seemingly the same as in the human brain, and they're active. But this allows the opportunity to study disease because there are inherited 
developmental disorders. There are genes that affect one's risk for different disorders. Since you're a developmental neurobiologist, you're focusing on developmental disorders. And autism spectrum disorders, of course, is uh, very important because it seem to be becoming more common. And there the problem seems to occur in the embryonic development before birth, or at least start there. With schizophrenia, which you've really studied the most, uh, the abnormalities in my reading of literature may start shortly after birth. But can you, you talk about your work on schizophrenia and then more recently your interest in autism? Yeah, so uh, our interest in schizophrenia actually dates back uh, very early, uh, even before the IPSCs. Um, we are trying to understand how these risk factors or genetic mutations in humans of single genes uh, impact the human, uh, impact the neurodevelopment. And we started looking at those in uh, using adult neurogenesis that we mentioned earlier as a model uh, to study how those genes uh, might functionally impact different developmental processes. And as you said, now with the uh, development of iPSC technology, we have the opportunity to study what happens in human neurons. And uh, we've been focused on, uh, at the very beginning, we've been focused on a gene called DISC1 or disrupted in schizophrenia one. So as you can infer from the name, it's a gene identified from patients mostly uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. Of course, in later it has been associated with other major mental disorders as well. And we are lucky enough, actually, that this is the time when I was uh, as a faculty is still at Hopkins. We work with two clinicians and they are actually seeing a family uh, with a strong, uh, um, uh, with actually with many members have this major mental disorders and also with a mutation in this one gene. So this give us the rare opportunity to generate iPSCs from these patients and using that to, to try to study uh, what could be potentially going wrong during the development. So we, um, we get a patient fibroblast and program them into iPSCs from the family and then differentiate them into either neurons on the 2D culture conditions. So we have several publications on that and show that actually one of the things that's being impacted is the synapse formation. And um, later on, um, we also use this um, organoid as a model to study more systematically, systematically what's happening during the development. And there's a surprising finding is that we know um, during the neurogenesis phase, different type, I mentioned this, there's different type of neurons being generated and that they take some time for them to mature, right? Um, and in humans, this maturation process is actually is much longer. Um, but nevertheless, when we generate organoids, from the family members without mutation and it's normal and from the family members with the discipline mutation and diagnosis with major depression or schizophrenia, what we found that actually there's even earlier developmental deficits in that the, cell, the neurons does not seem to be maturing at the same pace as control. It took, it took them much longer to mature when you compare to the uh, to to the to the control organoids, so that's actually a surprising finding for us, and we're, I mean we're continuously working on those right now. Now, so disc one, um, so typically the uh, gen genetic defects that cause uh, human disease are classified as either gain of function or loss of function. 
gain of function is when the mutated gene has some property that it doesn't normally have, whereas loss of function is where the normal function of the gene is impaired. Based on the name, am I right in assuming that disrupted in schizophrenia is loss of function or not? So, yeah, so that's another finding. Uh, I, I mean, this is a cumulative from our work, both from mouse studies and from this IPSC-based model studies. We found this uh, mutation actually is a more like a gain of function oh, okay. um, mutation. And the reason how it works that we know that um, this one actually dimerizes. And then when there is a mutant disc one, which is expressed, and then they somehow can drag the wild type uh, when they dimerize to uh -huh. the degradation. So if you look at, so if you have a single allele mutation, which is the case for all patients, they only have a one allele mutation of the disc one. Uh, and pre presumably this leads to haploid insufficiency, meaning that you only have 50% of the protein level expressed under normal conditions. However, when we look at either in mouse models or in this uh, IP, patient IPSCs, what's happening is that the wild type uh, this quant level actually is extremely low. So uh, way lower than 50%. Oh. So this suggests that it could be function as a gain of function mutation that uh, actually uh, leads to the degradation of the wild type as well. Okay, very, that's very interesting. Um, and what's next on the schizophrenia front for you? You have more things planned to move forward. So for example, eventually some of your work is gonna lead, and I think you're doing this, lead to some new ideas for how, for the, for the treatment of diseases. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so of course, that's our ultimate goal uh, to see if whether we, our research can, can have an impact both uh, either in the prevention or the treatment of the patients. And that's the, as I think that's also the drive why we want to move into this human-based or uh, even disease-based uh, IPSC models. Um, so what we are trying to do now, because this one uh, is a very, very rare mutation. And it happens probably only in, in a couple of uh, families around the world. Uh, but there's many recent uh, genome studies, genome-wide studies have identified many additional mutations uh, in the uh, uh, affect single genes or uh, affecting uh, multiple genes at the same time. I think this patient-derived iPSC is giving us the opportunity to ask if you're getting the iPSCs from the patients with different mutations, right? Um, whether we can find a convergent uh, changes during development yeah. and whether we can use that either at the cellular level, at the synapse level, or at the molecular level, whether we can identify uh, specific targets to target those uh, uh, dysfunctioned uh, pathways and to generate better treatment. Of course, that's something we're trying. So we're generating iPSCs, uh, from different patients. We are also now use a genome editing approach uh, to uh, introduce mutations of a specific genes, or we can even do um, corrections in the patients. In this uh -huh. case, actually, we have done it uh -huh. with the disc one patient lines. Uh -huh. We correct the mutation so that we can prove in a causality yeah. way that's this deficit is indeed caused by this new uh, mutation. Yeah, that's. I think that's the the future of of, of the clinical thing. Is the um, CRISPR Cas1, the gene editing, uh, where you can correct genetic defects, uh, and it's it's now been used in a, a couple of clinical trials. And yeah, I'm very. That's a 
exciting new area. Um, and what about your work on autism? Yeah, so, so along a similar line, uh, autism is also considered, of course, a neurodevelopmental deficit, uh, uh, the disorder. And we are uh, we're generating uh, iPSCs either directly from patients or with the CRISPR editing and try to understand how this impact the development at the different phases from the stem cell differentiation to different type of neuron generation to synapse formation. So these are the things that we can do uh, using this uh, uh, new uh, model systems. In, in autism, I have some interest in autism, even though we didn't do any actual experiments on it. From the standpoint of neural network hyperexcitability, so I mentioned that glutamate is the most prominent neurotransmitter and it's the excitatory transmitter. And there's a lot of evidence that excessive hyperexcitability of neurons contributes to, uh, well, epilepsy, it's obvious. You get seizures, with this, this, the glutamatergic neurons are hyperactive. But we also think in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, there's more insidious hyperexcitability. And autism, my understanding is that there's quite a bit of evidence that neural networks, at least in certain brain regions, are hyperexcitable in kids with autism. For example, the incidence of seizures is yep. greater in kids with autism compared to kids without autism. And then in the animal models where mutated genes that cause autism, like fragile X syndrome, for example, in humans, you put those mutations in mice and there's hyperexcitability. Um, so this is the kind of things you can look at, right, with uh, your IPSC derived organoids and so on. Yes, so these are the things. Um, doing electrophysiology or even uh, uh, to look at the uh, plasticity is still something uh, I think not that easy yeah. from the brain organoids. Yeah. And that's, I think that's, but that's definitely the direction to go in the future um, to see whether at the more uh, circuitry level, whether there's uh, this regulation. Um, I think this needs a, a further improvement uh, in the uh, organoid technology. At, at a, at a, you know, from an electrophysiologist standpoint at a crude level, uh, so in humans, most people are aware of EEGs, electroencephalogram, which is kind of gives an idea of the overall activity uh, of neural networks in the brain. And something that just popped into my mind is in these organoids, you may be able to use like a crude electrode and just like put it on the surface of the organoid, kind of like the EEG electrode on the surface of the brain and see if you get a signal. Then, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it would be much easier technically, as you mentioned, actually recording from neurons with an electrode is very difficult. Uh, so anyway, I'm, that's just an idea. Yeah, so, so we actually have thought about that as well to see whether we can record EEG-like activities from oh. the brain. One actually uh, thing have been used, I think now quite a bit, uh, um, um, for mostly for 2D cultures, and I think pe people are moving into this 3D organoid cultures is that is to use the multi-electro array. So this comes as the plate formats and you can either put the cells, culture, culture cells or put the whole organoid on top of this, this, this uh, MEA plates and try to record activities. Yeah, that's something we are currently working on as well. Okay, another, before we move on to and talk about Zika and uh, maybe COVID, one last thing on, on the iPSCs and organoids. Now, I, I had one 
One postdoc who spent a lot of time trying to directly uh, convert astrocytes, glial cells, to neurons mm -hmm. by doing these different gene manipulations. And there was a publication we saw, and we tried that, and we it didn't never work. So we never got it to work. But this is something people are exploring, which is very relevant to in vivo and therapeutic interventions. So for example, uh, neurons die in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. Uh, so the, the kind of dreaming idea is that maybe we can uh, put a gene in astrocytes that causes them to directly form new neurons, and then those new neurons will integrate. Um, and this could be done in theory using what we call viral vectors, where you have the gene in a virus, you put the virus, these are innocuous viruses like adeno-associated virus, AAV, they've been used in humans. And then like you, you correct the defect or whatever, and and then uh, or even replace neurons. Have you had any interest in that? Or I haven't kept up on that particular area. Yeah, so that's actually uh, I think it's a very interesting idea by direct conversion of other cell types to a different cell type. And as you said, it's especially relevant in the brain uh, if you have whether we can replace lost neurons by converting astrocytes, which is an abundant uh, glial cell type in the brain. Um, we haven't done anything in my lab uh, on this conversions, but uh, actually I think it's a still a kind of a controversial area. There are quite a few recent publications demonstrating this conversion in vivo it's actually, it's a very rare event. Yeah. Uh, although you, you probably can do this very robustly in vitro, but in vivo actually is not as easy. Well, until Yamanaka's work, uh, people didn't really think you can take skin fibroblasts and, and convert them into the essentially early embryonic cells and form any tissue. So we'll see, I, I think, uh, you know, it may be possible. Yeah, I, I think it could be, it could be possible and as long as you can uh, identify the right condition, right? Yeah. Now uh, let's talk to infect about infectious agents. So uh, one of my good friends is Avi Nath, who yeah. is the, now the clinical director at, at the Neurological Institute at NIH. And I, co-mentored a graduate student, and then I mentored actually a postdoc. Uh, Avi has been kind of a pioneer in showing that HIV uh, has adverse effects on the brain. In fact, many people uh, with HIV AIDS who, now there's these uh, protease inhibitors that have a really dramatic beneficial effect keeping these people alive when they would have previously died. But it turns out that these drugs, these protease inhibitors, at least some of them don't get into the brain. And many of people with HIV AIDS now are getting dementia, cognitive problems when they get in their 50s, they're having problems. Now, in the case of HIV, Avi and others, and we helped a little, have shown that there's two proteins produced by the virus that have bad effects on neurons. They're toxic to the neurons. And for example, we showed can increase the vulnerability of neurons to hyperexcitability and cytotoxicity. So you've been studying initially Zika, which of course, uh, pregnant women have to be very worried about, although now it seems like Zika's died out and there haven't been many cases. So can you talk about your work on Zika and your insights into how it adversely affects brain development? Yeah, so that's actually a very, uh, a very interesting story that 
Um, as you know, we've been focusing on neurodevelopment. I haven't really worked on the viral virus that much. Yeah. Besides using that those as a tool to uh, to to manipulate different genes um, in, in our systems. So when we initially established our first protocol of four brain organoids, so I went to a meeting. This was actually at the very early days of the brain organoid field. So I went to a meeting. Uh, organized by Jorgen Noblik, who was the one first published the brain organoids uh, protocol. And um, so I gave the talk about our research uh, developing this brain region specific organoids. And uh, of course, it's a very interesting and we would like to get it to a top, uh, top uh, tier journal. And the cell editor, uh, was there, so I talked to her and say, well, uh, are you interested in our study? What do you think we, uh, we need to do more to make you more interested? And she said, this is an exciting study. And if you could show some disease relevance, that would be great. So I came back from the meeting and talked to the student who was working on this, uh, uh, this project and said the editor seemed to like our study, like your study, but she wants to see a little bit more. And at that time it was the, the news about Zika virus and its potential correlation to uh, microcephaly was all over the news. Yeah. And he was reading the news actually at that one when, when I found him in the lab. And he basically said, he pointed to the screen and said, why not Zika virus? I thought that could be, a, that's a brilliant idea, but how do we get Zika virus? So we, we actually, and we found out uh, a friend of uh, mine actually, who also went to the graduate school at UCSD. I did, I went to graduate school at UCSD and he is a virologist. And he's actually trying to identify, uh, find someone working on neurodevelopment. So yeah, when we made the call, it was like an instant connection and said, let's work on this. So yeah, so that's how we um, uh, identified the first, first of all, using, uh, using our uh, IPSC derived culture systems that the targeting cells uh, by, for the Zika virus seem to be the neural stem cells. And as we know that all the nerve cells are generated by this neural stem cells. If you have the early targeting to, to this nerve, uh, neural stem cells and the, the consequence of uh, infection is actually cause the death and the loss of function of this neural stem cells. Mm -hmm. And then of course you, you are going to uh, generate much less cells. And that's exactly what we saw in our organoids. The result it, uh, organoids much smaller and exhibit features very much similar to microcephaly. Huh. So yeah, that um, allow us to make the link. Maybe this is one of, at least the, one of the major reasons that why Zika caused the microcephaly. I think that I believe that's the first line of evidence. Um, are, you, are you pursuing that with regards to how the Zika virus is causing death of the stem cells? Yeah, so we actually uh, then uh, performed a series uh, of experiments trying to identify uh, the potential molecular mechanisms. And we did find the mechanisms and we did a little actually more than that. We collaborated when, with NIH, actually NCAT, uh, and did a oh. drug screening oh. and even identified uh, uh, some molecules that can be neuroprotective and some mo molecules that are antiviral. But as you said, uh, the Zika virus basically kind of disappeared eventually. So uh, we didn't even get a chance for a clinical trials. Well, but I mean, it, it has obvious implications for other viruses that exactly affect. And this is a really good example of uh, so I like the way your mind works, Guo Li. You uh, 
so I assume you had these initial results and paper with the Zika, and then you say, oh, I'm going to write a grant proposal and get some more money to pursue that. And uh, yeah, I think this is really good. You have a very open mind. You go in the direction. You have some initial finding, and you go in that direction, and you branch out. Some scientists like focus on one specific aspect their whole career. Uh, so you and I are a lot alike. We we like to pursue the most exciting thing that comes out of what the students are doing, you know, in the lab. And that I think it also it's good for the students and postdocs. You know, they have some like you mentioned you the. Your student was at the computer, or had just read about the Zika and so on. And then, yeah, that's great. Uh, and also, you know, with COVID, right, you now have some interest in COVID and whether it might affect brain development or even, a, I guess, a, in that respect, adult neurogenesis or the adult brain. So what, what have you done so far and, and what are your plans? Yeah, so actually that's uh, another thing. Um, uh, I, I, I found it's actually interesting exactly as you said, the, sometimes um, they will lead you to different roads, um, but um, sometimes we got criticized uh, that we are not so focused, right? Seems you are working on all different sorts of things. But anyways, um, for yeah, some- Yeah, well, that, when I was writing, of course I was at NIH for 20 years, I didn't have to write grants then. But before that, the main criticism I had from all my grant proposals is you're trying to do too much focus. And Actually, if that's the only criticism, I think that's good because that means they're actually not criticizing the science. Yep. Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Anyways, so back okay. to the SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. Actually, at very, very beginning, when the our SARS uh, COVID-19 started in the United States, uh, our collaborator at NIH, which we collaborated on the Zika virus study asked us whether we are interested in SARS-CoV-2. And my initial response to him is that I haven't heard anything related to brain development about this virus. Uh, so I'm not that interested in it. Uh, so we put that away and another few months passed and there's more and more reporting about the neurological problems associated with COVID-19. Yes. Of course, there's uh, its a impact on other systems other than respiratory, res respiratory systems. So we said now maybe uh, uh, we could look into why there's a neurological outcomes. And at the time, uh, as you probably know, uh, only COVID-19 related research uh, was allowed uh, for a period of time, right? Uh, basically, we have to shut down our labs. And we have all this uh, organ, brain organoids I mentioned earlier. We have this uh, cortical for brain organoids. We have mid-brain organoids. We also have hippocampal organoids. And we can then apply this organoids rather than uh, throw them down the drain. Maybe we can look uh, whether the uh, SARS-CoV-2 had impact on this organoids. So we uh, started a collaboration again because we don't work on virus. Uh, this time is with uh, um, uh, uh, a group at the UCSD and the San Sanford Burnham uh, group. And basically we send out our organoids to them. They, uh, they did the infection and fix the organoids and send back to us and we'll, we perform the analysis. And we found actually a very interesting phenomenon where we get this very few cells, neurons, uh, 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 some, sometimes astrocytes get infected in, in the organoids. The infection rate is extremely low. 
Um, however, in our hippocampal organoids, uh, sometimes these organoids are not, we haven't, at that time, we haven't published our work on hippocampal organoids uh, yet, because we know these hippocampal organoids are not kind of pure because sometimes they are uh, regions is more like a chorea plexus. Uh, in development, these two regions are connected, co-developed. So the, they rely on different, uh, the gradients of BMP and, and wind signaling. So we have hippocampal organoids and sometimes with the chorus plexus tissues uh, wisdom. And whenever there's an organoid with that, the infection rate is much higher and especially in the core plexus region. Huh. So, so uh, that's, that, again, that's a surprising finding to us. So my student uh, actually is an MD PhD student at that time. So he decided to specifically generate organoids of core plexus. And he was uh, successful actually uh, in generating a very pure core plexus organoids. And then we repeat the experiments and indeed, uh, the infection rate is more than 10 times more than a regular organoids in this a new choroid plexus organoids so that we can uh, show that in this new choroid plexus organoids, the infection rate is high. They also kill the cells and reduce the function of these cells as well. Uh, so, uh, and also uh, 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 gene changes related to immune response so that's, yeah, so that's basically yeah. another surprising finding for us as well. That's very intriguing. The choroid plexus that kind of lines the ventricles. Um, exactly. And it's involved in production of cerebrospinal fluid, the, the fluid that bathes the brain. And at, when I was at NIH, uh, colleagues of mine, I, we helped, I helped a little bit. They showed that uh, the, the choroid plexus cells respond to insulin in very interesting ways, uh, uh, which is kind of interesting because of insulin's role in energy metabolism, uh, so. Yeah, that's yeah. very interesting, especially the, all the recent, a lot of the recent publications trying to link uh, to the uh, GI system, to the brain. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's extremely interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I think we've covered a lot of ground, Guo Li. And I'll ask, um, when I put this up on YouTube in the description thing, I'll have uh, links to some of your work. Is there any particular uh, resources on the internet that I can direct people to to find out more about your work? Yeah, so we have a lab web page. Yeah. And I think we have a lab Twitter account. I don't have a personal Twitter account, but we have a lab Twitter account. Uh, maybe we can link that. And I'll, I'll put a link to, I looked at a couple of your lectures. Uh, on YouTube, and that will be, of course, we're just talking, right? You're not showing any images showing the stem cells and the neurons and the organoids. So you have some nice, uh, at least a few lectures that people can look at if they want to actually get visual. A picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. And so, uh, you know, some of the listeners didn't follow with some of the technical details and can't really visualize what we're talking about. I'll, I'll point them in the right direction. Yeah, so um, actually I have a TED Matt talk. Uh, ah, okay, okay, I'll put that maybe, there. Yeah, that's mostly uh, about our Zika work with the Zika virus, so. Okay. Good, it's good to see you again and to know you're doing good up in Philly. Yeah, nice uh, to see you again. Say hi to Hong Jun. Of course. Bye. Yeah, bye.